right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. So I'm the co-founder of the AI Education Project. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're helping to educate students about artificial intelligence and the future of work. Um, and we're actually partnering with the ASU GSP Summit this year. Um, we've hosted a number of events, uh, and this is one of those one of those events that's really looking to unpack what does this mean when we talk about the future of work and the future of artificial intelligence and how it's going to impact students and how does it what does it mean for educators? Um, so, you know, put simply, we know that schools in the U.S. are not talking to students about many of the topics that are in vogue at this conference. Um, we're, you know, learning about emerging technologies. We're learning about um, what the future of work means. And there's this is one of probably 30 different panels uh, that are that are talking about artificial intelligence and and emerging tech. Um, but students who are literally in high school today making decisions about what the, you know, what their pathway will be, what their futures are going to be, aren't learning about this. Um, and so that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm joined by an incredibly esteemed panel. Um, and I'm bad with introductions, so rather than uh, steal their thunder, we'll just, we'll just go down the row and let each of the panelists introduce themselves. And, and maybe you could share just sort of like where do you intersect with this conversation about, about the workforce of the future? Um, so, Rene, we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Ronit Avni, and I'm the founder and CEO of Localized. We're a career tech platform that connects university students and recent graduates in emerging markets with industry experts to guide them and employers to hire them. And so we're constantly curating best-in-class experts in fields like fintech and edtech and medtech and AI to talk about how they can be ready and employable day one. Um, the other thing is that we've partnered with someone who's actually at the conference as well, Dr. Tanya Mishra, who runs an AI boot camp called Sure Start, and she runs it on Localized um, as a platform. So we, we have quite a bit of focus on AI. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I am Bob Akmos uh, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instructional Support, and Innovation at Gwinnett County Public Schools. Uh, so we are kind of the pre-K-12 uh, startup to this point, and we're actually trying to start these conversations with our kids um, through an AI um, education program that we're piloting for about 9,000 students um, that goes uh, sort of pre-K-12. Um, we have, just for context, 180,000 students. We're located just northeast of, of Atlanta. Um, and we're really glad to be a part of this esteemed panel. Thank you. Hi, my name's Leanne Delizer. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Computer Science for All. Uh, we work at the systems change level to really help bring computer science education, including AI education, to youth all over the United States. And if I'm going to think about like where I intersect with the future of work, I'm going to be the contrarian on the panel and say it's not the future. If it was the future, we wouldn't be running workshops today for educators about how to use data science and AI to inform their formative teaching practices, right? We have to stop calling it the future and just say it is work. Um, so that's uh, my perspective and intro. Good afternoon, my name's Ken McNeely and I'm president of AT&T for the Western region. Um, so I manage uh, our operations in the Western part of, of the United States. And, um, you know, I like to describe our company now as a 140-year-old startup because we continue to chase uh, the ways that uh, consumers want to connect with each other. And, uh, you know, certainly the pandemic proved or revealed uh, many inadequacies. And um, so happy to be here to talk about the future of connectivity and all the many applications that we have yet to see. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so, Dr. Delice, I'm going to start with you because I'd like you to unpack this. You know, when we talk about, we've been talking about 21st century skills for a long time. Um, we're still talking about 21st century skills, and, and we're sort of now a quarter of the way into the 21st century. Um, what, what does that mean to you, like in, in your work with schools and you talk to educators? Like, how do you frame that? Yeah, I got my first teaching job in 1997. So, 21st century skills were like all the rage as a brand new teacher in the 90, 1990s. And we have to recognize what we define 21st century skills to be 30 years, 40 years ago, meant word processing and spreadsheets. And we're still making a call to infuse, quote unquote, 21st century skills. We've not renamed it. 
And we haven't been explicit about what we're putting in there when we talk about being ready to work in this technological, empowered, enabled, and recommended world to us. And so how do we, as educators, as education leaders, as policymakers making critical decisions around education, realize that the push for 21st century skills is as outdated as the technology that existed in the 1990s when I first started teaching as well. Yeah, so, so on that, the topic of that push, um, can, you know, at t has committed billions of dollars towards uh, bridging the digital literacy gap and bridging the digital divide. Um, what does at t see, um, you know, coming that, that is sort of prompting all of this action and investment? Sure, Alex. I mean, I would say about about a decade ago, it became very clear to us that there was um, um, first an education gap. I mean, we were actually seeing, as a technology company, uh, when we talk about 21st century skills, that the schools were not creating graduates that were prepared to enter uh, the fields of technology adequately, uh, um, adequately skilled. And we knew that at that particular time, <clears throat> we couldn't rely just on government to fund education and provide the kind of skills and the kinds of support that would be necessary to create that uh, that workforce. And we knew when we wanted to take a leadership position in, in public-private partnerships, we knew that it would take the private sector working together uh, with the public sector to help close that, that, that gap. And uh, we initiated a, a several programs early on, billion dollar programs that worked, that, that, that didn't try to um, um, invent a new way of thinking about education. What we really wanted to do is that we knew that there were many, many nonprofit organizations out there working, working already with, uh, with the public sector and uh, but ha were, were challenged in scaling their, uh, the, the work that they were doing. There was some wonderful work being done in different communities across America. And we wanted to help um, identify and grow those, um, uh, those, those organizations to help them continue to do what they're doing. And we started some incubators around um, ed tech that we would fund much like any other type of um, uh, you know, venture capitalist where we would go in and fund the nonprofit to help create and to scale at a level to be able to really make an impact in communities across the country. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And so, Babak, you, you, your, your school is an example of uh, uh, an organization that, that has this connectivity and that has, are, are your students one-to-one? -one? Uh, they will be soon, yeah. Be We're soon. very close to it this year. And so, so you have laptops for the students, you have all of these opportunities. What, what did you decide to do um, to actually do something with that technology and, and sort of bring that digital literacy to them. And maybe you can talk a bit about the AI program that, that you yeah, built. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, being from a really large uh, school system, a public school system, a lot of people go, oh, like, we know what that's like. And I'd like to tell you, like, it's, that's not what Gwinnett County Public Schools is. So we, to give you a sense, in the pandemic, within 48 hours, we flipped on its head our entire meal service program. Uh, so we were serving 260,000 meals from school buses within 48 hours of the pandemic hitting. We had 18,000 hotspots to hit kids everywhere across our school system um, within weeks of the pandemic hitting. We had uh, 65,000 computers going out to, to children um, who needed them and those sorts of things. Um, and that, I think that same sense of urgency, that same belief that kids need to be ready for their future um, has been pervasive throughout how we do our work. And so we're a continuous quality improvement organization, which typically means nothing, right? Um, but, but in our system, we really believe it. And literally every single day we look around and say, um, are we doing enough? Are we preparing kids for their future, right? Uh, and so I have a kindergartner who's in our school system, um, and she, she'll be hopefully, knock on wood, graduating in 2034 or so. Um, and I ask myself, is our kindergarten today preparing my daughter for 2034, right? Um, and our answer at a certain point a few years back was, no, we don't think so. We think we're doing a lot better than a lot of other people, but we don't think we're preparing them for the world of the future. Um, and so as we talk to our uh, partners, our business partners and things across the country, um, we started seeing similarly, people weren't saying, hey, you guys don't do enough social studies or you guys don't do enough reading in school. They're saying, hey, like kids aren't coming to us ready to perform, ready to innovate, creatively problem solve, and those sorts of things. And then we saw the, you know, up coming and really here 
technologies around AI, and we realize the workforce of the future is now, right? We're a quarter of the way uh, into the 21st century. Like, this is like, come on, we got to do something. So um, we have started a, a K-12 um, AI uh, cluster, a theme of, of schools. Uh, we have about 9,000 kids in it right now, where we're uh, innovating and, and piloting our first ever embedded um, artificial intelligence curriculum that we developed alongside of a whole bunch of business partners. Um, and we, we help lead the team um, that that uh, built out the first three AI courses officially in the state of Georgia for students to be able to access as well. Um, and we really believe that AI education is for all students. Uh, and so we built it not for you know, people who are elites or gifted or this and that, but really because every, every job out there is gonna be impacted in some capacity, we really built it for everybody. And can you share a bit more about what actually the students are learning? I mean, is it, are they learning to code or is it, is it one level up? Sure. Well, so we started with our CS for All work, and we can't thank you enough uh, for the resources and the push and, and the, uh, the, those sorts of pieces. Um, but we don't believe it ends there, right? So um, that's just, for us, the computer science, the programming, coding, the data science pieces are one piece of the bigger puzzle. We really believe that, like, for your average consumer or your average developer, you're going to need a, a lot of information around, like, the ethical implications of a AI and algorithms that are out there. We need to make sure that our students know how to collaboratively lead together and problem solve. Um, we had a great partnership with IDEO around um, design thinking work for our students and getting them to sort of think in new ways and be able to problem solve in different ways. So we, when we think about sort of not 21st century skills, but current skills, we think we call them future ready skills. Um, and really, it's like today's skills. <laughs> but, but it includes the whole spectrum of skills. Alex, can I add to that? Because that, that's exactly what, you know, as we thought about the skills that were lacking in current graduates, those are exactly the skills we were talking about. And there was the ability to collaborate and to think critically. Mm -hmm. Because we live, in a, we live in a time now where, you know, when I was in school, it was all about the facts. I mean, you have to memorize facts. Now the facts um, are just a click away. Mm -hmm. and, but it's what do you do with those facts? How do you analyze them? How do you know that they're right? I mean, how do you, and, and so it's all about critical thinking and what do you do with the facts that you have? And I'm really happy to hear that, that you've really incorporated that because that's what, that, those are some of the things that the technology industry was really, uh, you know, urging education to grab. Yeah, and I think, can the facts come at you faster? Yeah. Um, so I helped start a couple of schools in New York City, including the Bronx Academy for Software Engineering. And one of my favorite example lessons, uh, the history teacher partnered with the computer science teacher and basically they were studying the French Revolution. She assigned every student in her class a, a persona from that time. So you had like the farmer, the foot soldier, the general, the, the white, like all of the different people. And they had to tweet for a week <laughs> from their character. <laughs> And then the students worked with the computer science teacher to analyze the tweets to see what was going on and what they were learning about in their social studies class and how it impacted their, their personas. And that information came at them really fast. And then the social studies teacher, I mean, this was you know six years ago, was looking at the Arab Spring and what was happening in the Middle East and the way that Twitter was being used as a communication vehicle at the time. And it really connected the students to how important access to flow of information can either silo or connect, can either help you understand or separate. Um, and those lessons, right? That's exactly what you were talking about earlier today was those lessons, those understandings, those thinkings, that's what we want students to do and that's what you need them to do when they turn into employees. Yeah, and Rene, your company works across the sec different sectors, and you're really helping companies to figure out how they're resourcing and how they're up-leveling um, people and getting them ready. I mean, what are some of the things that you've learned, um, and maybe even just share a bit more about Localize and sort of the work that you're doing? Sure, absolutely. So I, I would say there's one more piece that I would add to this that I think is a critical component, which is having what in, internally, we, we never use this externally, I would refer to as proximate role models. So people that you credibly believe, you look at them, they're ahead of you working in these fields of the future that you believe you can become. It's this idea of if that person can do it, maybe I can too. And it's gotta be somebody close enough that it's realistic. So one of the things, when we started Localized, 
We actually started speaking about the Middle East. We started in the Middle East and North Africa. We started with universities where there weren't robust um, career employer and alumni services infrastructure. And what we did is we brought experts who shared roots with the students working in these fields of the future at the vanguard. So if we're talking about, let's say, careers in supply chain, we would have the person responsible for all supply chains for Apple talking about how robotics and automation and AI are impacting careers in supply chain management, but he's Tunisian. And so we would bring in these individuals to say, this is what industry needs. This is how we recommend. This is a day in the life of my job. This is how we got here. To give that insight, the kind of, um, uh, you know, elite schools have these elite num alumni networks that essentially do this all the time. It's about social capital, right? And so democratizing the social capital was the thing that we started to do. And, and as we expanded, we operated first in Jordan and then across the Middle East, now Sub-Saharan Africa, now we're expanding into LATAM. But we're bringing in these experts in AI, in cryptocurrencies, and, and we were talking the other day some of our industry experts, the industries are changing so rapidly that they're getting their news from Twitter. So going back to what you were saying, especially in crypto as an example. So, you know, often by the time some of these topics are taught in class, they're already out of date. And not because there aren't incredible educators and universities that are open-minded, but because it's just the, the exponential rate of change is just so dramatic. And so um, I know Reid Hoffman had said, learn from people, not classes. And I, I really believe that that combination of getting the fundamentals in some sort of structured learning environment coupled with those role models that can push you, and then the opportunities so that you're hearing from industry. So we're obsessed with bringing the absolute top experts in these fields of the future, but have, who have global roots. They're, they're Nigerian, they're Turkish, they're, you know, you name it. Um, and, and what we found is that even though we started in the Middle East and North Africa, universities like Columbia were signing up because our experts were so both diverse and excellent and represented um, access to conversations that they didn't have previously. So that, that's where we're operating at. I love what I'm hearing. Also as a parent, I love what I, I'm hearing. Um, you know, and I think that we're now moving into an era where we all have to get used to the idea that we're going to face perpetual professional anxiety because we're all going to be out of date. Our skills are all going to be out of date. We're all going to need to upskill every you know, six months or three years or, or whatever that moving target is. And so learning to kind of embrace that anxiety and fear of obsolescence by making sure that there are people a few steps ahead of us that we can learn from and interact with. Can I jump in on that? That really resonates with me. And, you know, um, as a public school system, we are extremely diverse, right? We have, a, like, like the, the school where we're piloting our AI work is approximately 25% African-American, 25% Latino, 25% uh, Caucasian. Um, and then I guess everybody else like me, uh, who we don't know which, where, where we fit in. But, um, but we, what I appreciate about that, though, is that we really have this belief that we have to prepare everybody for this future that's coming, right? I think too often in the past, you know, things happen to us uh, or things happen to the world. And and we don't think and plan strategically to make sure everyone is a part of that future. Um, and so, so what you're saying about role models and mentors that, that you can see yourself in really resonates with me. And uh, you know, one one saying we have in our system is that um, you know we want every child to be able to swim in the world of AI and the world of the future, right? Meaning, like today, you can't go like I don't like email, like I don't do that, like that's not a thing, right? You can't be like I don't like computers. You know, 30 years ago, you might have been able to get away with that, right? Um, but we need everybody to be able to swim. You can't just like drown in there. But then we also believe that most kids need to be able to snorkel, meaning they need to be able to work it, right? They need to be able to like, if a printer doesn't work, not going, it's not working. But actually like, hey, maybe I need to put paper in it, right? <laughs> maybe I need to do some basic things to it, those basic interactions. And then we believe that there are going to be kids who want to scuba dive. Um, and like those are the people who are going to be our future developers. And within all of that, we believe that we need to change the narrative of who those people are that fall in those buckets, right? And we've been really uh, successful in getting a lot of young girls, for example, um, early on, as early as kindergarten, into our AI work. Um, and they're significantly overrepresented over by middle school, similar with our students who have uh, individual education plans and those sorts of things. Um, and it's, yeah, I think we need to build a more inclusive and, and just feature together. Yeah, so, so Dr. Delizer, we we've been at the project of advancing computer science in schools for decades now. and. Um, you know, I think 
you know, on the one hand, I think amazing progress has been made, but, you know, my mom teaches, she's a principal in Akron Public Schools, and it's about 10,000 students, and um, there's one computer science teacher for the entire district. Um, and so, you know, I think for Akron Public Schools, when they hear technology, their, their first inclination is, well, we don't have the capacity to teach technology to students because we just don't have the resources internally. And so, you know, Babak, when you talk about, you know, actually incorporating other approaches to connecting technology with other, uh, other coursework and, and uh, Dr. Delizer, your example that you gave right there, which is actually like sort of connecting with, the, with history and the humanities. Um, you know, it sounds like an interesting approach, but I'm curious, like what have we learned from the, the work in computer science equity uh, that could apply as we try to think about all of these other emerging technologies that go beyond just coding? Yeah, absolutely, and there's a reason why, so Computer Science for All is a fairly new organization. Um, we started with a small National Science Foundation gift in 2016 to an organization called CSNYC, which we are still the same 501c3, but we've rebranded because we do national work. Um, and our, our specific strategy right now is to raise awareness of the need for computer science education and to build capacity in our local leaders and institutions in order to implement high quality computer science education. There's been this one deficit narrative across the United States. There are no teachers, there are no internet, there's no computers, there's no desire, there's no capacity, and we have to stop saying no. Our school systems have a ton of strength. They have amazing leaders and amazing educators, and we have to stop thinking about teachers as the cog in someone else's workforce. They are not there only to build the workforce of someone else and the future. They are a workforce unto themselves. And so how do we treat them as such and respect them as such as professionals and provide them the same professional learning that you provide your AT&T employees, I'm sure, on a regular basis to keep their skills current, right? And how do we recognize that they have skills that will forever remain at the forefront? They're creative problem solvers, their empathy for children, their ability to look at someone in front of them and build what that human needs to move to their next level. Those skills will forever remain relevant and important. So what are the minor things that we need to bring to them to upskill them as we're upskilling the rest of our country to live in this technological age, I think is really, really, really important and something we have to recognize. We keep talking about this without talking about our teachers as a workforce that needs collective building and action and we are going to end up in a deficit narrative of them, which unfortunately leads to even more of the, well, not me, not, not my classroom, because you're just telling me I'm not good enough, so I'm gonna believe you in this moment when I'm overwhelmed. Can I, may I just add two data points? Sometimes also there's a perspective shift that is helpful, so for us, um, you know, when we talk about ec equity in this space, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking about, let's say, gender equity, it's been interesting for us operating in the Middle East where certain countries, 57% of STEM graduates are women, right? And so sometimes you just, you just need to step out of your immediate context where there are a lot of assumptions to say, actually, it, this need not be in this way. And so, um, you know, on our team, for example, we have a product manager from Inugu, he's in Inugu, Nigeria. He taught himself to code on a whiteboard. He didn't have a computer. He taught himself to code on a whiteboard He's fantastic. And then he was able to Google and keep up, you know, online with all of the latest trends. Like, you don't need the state of the art. Obviously, it's wonderful if you have it. But um, there's not one way to do this. And, and a lot of the AI and a lot of the coding training is actually offline, especially in the early years. It's about logic. It's about, it's about you know, there, it, it's, it's, um, it's a way of thinking. It's not necessarily being attached to a particular device. Uh, and I think for teachers, that can be a freeing realization that there are all kinds of ways to teach the skills of the future without having to necessarily have the, the most fancy infrastructure. Yeah, and I love that notion of paradigm shift because I think for the CS education movement, if you're asked what we've learned about equity is that we suck at it. We've been working on gender equity, we've been working on equity with race, we've been working on equity with socioeconomic status, and a decade into this work, right, over a decade into, multiple decades into this work, we are still barely moving the needle by minimal percentage points um, when it comes to our ability 
to not just include in the entry level classrooms, but to inspire into the life changing careers, the economic changing careers for communities and families. And so we have to say to ourselves, like, we suck at this. And so at CS for All, we're starting a new call to the community to stop looking at equity from the walls in. Our model of equity is constantly look at all the seats. What is the number and the color and the shape of the butts who are sitting in our seats? And we're constantly perceiving the learning spaces one room at a time. But youth don't learn in one room at a time. They, we need our public schools because we need 100% of students and that's where they live. But we need our communities. We need those near peer mentors. We need them to be surrounded by the opportunity to go deep and learn things that are beyond those initial points of view. And we need our community partners because their inspiration, their resilience within that community, their ability to activate parents and neighbors to really inspire surrounds each one of those individual youth. And so we have to look at it as the array of what's around a child, not the number of children who are sitting in a learning space when we consider equity. I really like that, Dr. Leiser. We, we, um, one of the common threads that we've all been talking about has been sort of the stigmatization of technology as this, this sort of other thing that some people are good at, that some people get to do or aspire to, and if you get there, you're gonna be successful, um, but there's a lot of people who also feel like I'm not a technologist, I think technology is, is beyond me or out of reach. Um, there's still, I think, even societally, we think about nerds and like that, the, the sort of, the nerd stigma still hasn't gone away. Like we're working hard at that, but it still exists. Um, and one of the things that, that you mentioned is sort of, you know, even at the community level, like th thinking about how communities perceive themselves. And um, so Ken, you know, one of the things I'd like to ask you is, you know, I'm from Ohio and I know that you know, when I was growing up, I assumed that if I wanted to work in technology, I had to move to basically the Bay Area, San Francisco, maybe Boston. Um, and that's obviously changed. I think people across the country, not just because of the pandemic, but especially after the pandemic, there was this realization that work is actually distributed. You don't have to be in a specific geography. Um, and so I think about, you know, when we talk about equity, we often talk about race, we often talk about socioeconomic status. Um, less often do we, do we talk about geography and, you know, these rural communities that are, that in Ohio is especially the case, are the least likely to have access to those technology programs. And um, how has, how have you seen sort of over the last two years even, like has that, have you seen that dynamic changing or is this still a talking point that we're trying to get to but not quite there yet? Well, I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I, mean, I wish it were um, a solution solved, um, but, but I do think, I, I do think the pandemic uh, ripped the Band-Aid off and, and revealed many, uh, many of the um, uh, inequities that we, we knew to exist but not as, not as significant because, you know, we thought of technology as something that was nice to have uh, uh, and not as something that was absolutely critical. And I think the pandemic really showed technology is not in, just for entertainment. It is now for work and education, and those lines are completely blurred now, and it did reveal. And I think that um, it certainly, I think, um, um, encouraged our policymakers to really double down on the kind of funding that's necessary for building out the infrastructure. One of the things that we were um, 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 supportive of and urged uh, the administration the, in the White House was that the American Rescue Plan really needed to have broadband infrastructure dollars attached to it because as, as altruistic as corporations can be, there's still, you know, you still have to make money. It's a business. And so there are communities, there are rural communities, there are um, sparsely populated communities that simply um, businesses cannot make the numbers work going there, but are willing to if there's some assistance uh, uh, from the public sector, from government. And I think that what we're seeing now with the American Rescue Plan is the opportunity for, uh, for uh, connectivity companies to enter into public-private partnerships with local municipalities, with, um, with uh, even school systems, uh, to build out infrastructure uh, so that all can um, uh, avail themselves of it. But to your point around, you know, we saw 
one of, one of the um, um, significant disparities, I, I do live in the Bay Area, I live in San Francisco, uh, but there are many communities around the Bay Area. If you look at uh, the Central Valley, Salinas, I mean, it's not even, it's not even uh, 50 miles from, from Silicon Valley, and it's the tale of two cities, and it's um, mostly farm worker children. And you know, we wanted to create a program, because we know, as you've articulated, um, computer literacy is essential for everything we do now. You almost have to have a computer science degree just to stream your favorite show now. I mean, it's, it's, it's embedded, even for entry-level jobs, some type of computer literacy is necessary, and we've worked with a number of technology companies to create nano degrees. We uh, worked with Udacity to try to create some type of uh, entry-level certification program that gives um, uh, underserved communities the opportunity to go into a community college to get the kind of uh, support that might be necessary, and that certificate, that nano degree, we all agreed would be an entry-level certification that allows that person to come in and be an entry-level programmer in about 15 companies within uh, around the country. So, those kind that kind of creative thinking around how do we get this information out there, how do we support the communities? I think has been encouraged and um, energized through what was revealed through the pandemic. And I think it's to your point, you know, we're using the word literacy as, again, a word that's been around, computer literacy has been around for, what, 40 years, 50 years? Um, and so when people hear that term, we still keep going back to the notion of keyboarding, of word processing, of spreadsheets, right? When you, when you talk computer literacy to the teachers in your school, isn't yeah, that what the- That's where they start. Yeah. That's where they start. The, key, the keyboarding class somewhere yeah. else, yeah. And the thing is, is that when you use it as a business professional, we heard very clearly in that answer that you're also talking about computer science. You're talking about how technology impacts the world of work, how you as someone employed in that world can leverage technology to have your company do better, to have your social impact organization do better, to leverage data in a way to inform your decision making. And if we don't give those things active voice when we describe them, if we keep using 21st century skills, if we keep using computer literacy without being specific about how we have to upskill that definition, we're not, it's not that these are skills that are reserved for special students. This is not something that's going to unlock uh, the potential for higher earning or future of work. This is a gate. Mm -hmm. If they don't have these skills, they will not progress. We are not like somehow, oh, they'll be fine. They just won't be in a technology career. Guess what? Every career is a technology career. This is a gate to entry today, let alone when your kindergartner gets to that level. So we have to be really clear and specific when we're using these words, literacy and 21st century skills, because they mean something else to the educator who's been living in our school buildings for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years at this point. Yeah, if I can add to that, you know, one of the big things that we decided to do in Gwinnett was to not create some separate like AI class for everybody or not to add like one more set of things that a teacher needs to do, like they don't have enough work to do already, right? Um, and what we decided to do was to deliberately embed and upgrade existing lessons to build the how, right? right? Like the style of thinking, uh, the, the questions of a, of a kindergartner to prepare them to be empathetic, to pre prepare them to see problems from different perspectives, to know that you know, code really starts around like understanding logic, like inputs and outputs, which seems really basic, but a lot of, like, a lot of kids, a lot of adults, honestly, uh, haven't figured out, hey, when I do X, Y happens, right? Um, or when I type this code in this way, this thing happens, right? Um, and so we made this deliberate um, connection across across our curriculum, whether you're in an English class or in a social studies classroom or whatever, to make sure that kids are being prepared every moment in those future readiness skills. Um, because if we don't do that, what's the point of the class? Like if I can say, my class isn't about future readiness, then what are you teaching, like, right? Why are, why are we teaching that class? Um, and so it's been really resonating with our teachers in particular, because they've realized, oh, like I can actually replace what I was doing with something that's more engaging, with something that's more practical. And when that kid challenges me and says, when am I gonna use this in life? Well, first of all, they're not challenging you anymore because they see it right then and there, right? Um, and I think that, that makes the big difference. 
So we've got about five minutes left, and I, I want to actually drill down on this idea of inspiring and exciting students because, you know, what we see so often when we talk to schools, and, and Baba, your school is obviously an exception to this, but most schools are not actually doing career exploration in their classrooms. They're, if you're lucky, there's a guidance counselor or a career counselor who actually has that mandate. Uh, but very often, there's actually, one of the schools was in San Jose, Ken, and so it, they, they have uh, tracks, career tracks for students. And I asked, well, how do the students pick their track? And the principal said, well, you know, it's based on their parents and the community. We rely on them to, to help guide the students. And it's such a missed opportunity because in middle school, they could be actually showing students, like, here are some of these new careers that you may not even have realized, like, are connected to things that you're already interested in, like video games or, like, live streaming, you mentioned. Um, so what can we do to make it easy for schools to shine a light on, to your point, Dr. Delicer, it's not just what's happening in the future, but what's literally available now, today. There are credentials and, and opportunities right in front of them. Um, but how do we equip schools with sort of those tools to actually get students excited? So Alex, you worked with us on a report that we released last fall uh, called The Future of Problem Solving with Data and Intelligence. And we pulled together really a bunch of leaders in the space and looked from kindergarten to graduate school. How do we get more AI and data science education infused into every step of the educational process? And one of our recommendations is actually really simple. All, do you guys all remember like the personality test you took in sixth grade where you said, I like fish, so you should be a marine biologist. Except there are a million careers now where you can do something about fish that isn't just marine biologists. That personality test still exists today. We need to fix that. <laughs> and it runs off of something from the US Department of Labor that they actually updated last year. There's still only five technology careers at the bottom of that decision tree. Yeah. We have to separate the problems we want to solve as a nation from the skills that individuals will employ to solve those problems. Because you like fish, you could be a data scientist who studies fish. You could be a reporter who reports on climate change. You could be an artist who paints fish. You could own a fish store. Like there's so many different ways that you can be an entrepreneur, a businessman, a data scientist, a technologist, and still be able to do the thing you enjoy. And it has everything to do with the type of skills you also enjoy employing in that problem solving. So that's my really simple, take a look at the report. There's eight really strong recommendations for the community there. It's available on our website, csforall.org. I put a few cards around. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do individually in your own communities uh, in order to help uh, share that work. I, I want to offer a slightly contrarian view on that, which is that um, I would argue that, especially earlier stage, the personality tests are very flawed. Many of them are flawed. We actually, interestingly, like our team took two personality tests of our team just to assess what were the conclusions of each different one. And the outcomes were so dramatically different based on who designed the test that it was almost meaningless when you looked at the conclusions. So I would argue that exposure is so critical. There are so many kinds of jobs. We did a month in April last year of career matchups where we had experts talking about what's the difference between a growth product manager and a product manager, but the product manager, uh, the growth product manager was at TikTok and the product manager was at Udacity. Like even within a discipline like product manager, there might be 50 iterations of what that looks like. So exposure across a really wide range of opportunities. And the younger students have that exposure, the better. We don't operate at the middle school and high school level. We operate at university. But I think NEPRIS, if they're still around, I think that's what they do, actually. And so that might be a good resource. So I would just say the more we can again, democratize that social capital, give people access to those role models, the more likely they will be to explore. You know, I, I, I love that because, I mean, both of the examples, because you're, you, you're, you're, you're showing the students that they're currently using AI technology data today. They just don't know it. But I think the problem, the, the real challenge is to get the, the educator to understand that and to infuse it at all levels uh, of, in, in, the, in the classroom. I mean, knowing about, the, uh, knowing about TikTok, I mean, I do because I have a 14-year-old daughter, um, but, but when, I, when I want to have something that really resonates, I know now the examples that I need to draw from in order to give example that's meaningful to them. Do you want to have the last word? 
I mean, bottom line for us in Gwinnett, and I think for all of us, kids, we're already in the, in the future, right? Uh, these aren't 21st century skills, they're just skills, right? Um, and we need everybody to invest in our young people to get them there, no matter what zip code they're in, no matter what family structure they come from, or background, or home language, um, because all of us together are gonna build the future together. So thank you all for- Thank you so much. All right, that, that's our panel. Thank you, thanks for joining.